Today I want to talk about something that was very dear to the heart of Jesus, and that was his contentment. And I hope to make you feel guilty and discontent over your current level of contentment. <laughs> That's my job, right? Well, you know, why do we come together? What is, what is preaching? What is singing? What is praying? Yes, it's worship to God, but God doesn't need it as much as we need it. It pleases him, and he desires it. He de he's looking for us to worship him and to give him his honorable due, uh, which he so richly deserves in this hour of worship. But it's really for us. And I don't feel that as a preacher, my job is necessarily to tell you things you don't already know. Any more than we come here necessarily as adults to learn a lot of new information. Sometimes that happens, and praise God, but usually what it is, is we are reminded to not give up, to keep the faith, that there are things more important than all the things that are going on out here in the world. So let's talk about contentment a little bit today. You won't learn very much, but maybe you'll be encouraged to be content in your relationship with the Lord. I looked up what contentment was. I didn't agree with the definition, but this is the dictionary definition. Happy satisfied, and I love this one, it's so helpful, the state of being content. <laughs> well, I know what contentment is, it's when I get what I want, maybe. Two teardrops were floating down a river. One teardrop said, who are you? And the teardrop said, I am from a girl who lost her true love. Who are you? I'm from the girl who got him. Sometimes when you get what you want, you think you would be content. No, you might be temporarily satisfied. You might even be happy, joyous, comfortable, all of those things, more secure. But that is not what I'm talking about today. If we were to travel to the Eastern and to the Orient and ask them, what is contentment? Tao or Dao would say, it is the elimination of desires. You would just be content if you didn't want anything. Hmm. You know, the problem with that, it doesn't comport with Scripture. The scripture talks about things that we are to desire and that we are to seek. And God is the primary object of our search. So that doesn't really work for us. Then if we come back to the West, we'll say, well, what about enjoying the moment? And that commends itself to us. We all would like to enjoy the moment. Go ahead. Enjoy the moment. It's very enjoyable. Thank you. You know, uh, thank you, Lord. Uh, enjoy the moment. The story is told of an Eastern philosopher, teacher. Sasha shared this story with me. He was near death. All of his disciples gathered around him to hear what, you know, would be important last words. And as he heaved toward the end of his life, they listened very carefully, and finally he spoke. After they said, what are you thinking, Master? He said, I was just thinking of those two squirrels frolicking up on the roof, enjoying the moment even the moment of death. Yeah, that's, that's good, but surely it's more than that. The philosopher Frederick Nietzsche said, this is contentment, not to want anything to be different than it is. Nothing going forward, nothing looking backward, not even in all eternity. Just bear what is necessary, don't try to hide it, and even learn to love it. Hmm, that sounds philosophical. The American definition would be getting all you desire, and that usually means acquiring enough wealth to get the things that we think will make us happy. There was a very rich and wise man who was experiencing life and writing about it, and we'll read about that in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. This too is meaningless. As goods increase, so do those who consume them. And what benefit are they to the owner except to feast his eyes on them? I think he's thinking of piles of gold and jewels. The sleep of a laborer is sweet, whether he eats little or much. But the abundance of a rich man permits him no sleep. Hmm. How much is enough? Stories told of a man who was, who was told that he could get all the land that he could run around in in one day. So... 
rising early, he began to run in a very large circle. The only pro provision was that he must return to the point of origin where he started before the sun went down. And so being very anxious to acquire as much land as he could from the king, he began to run in a wide circle. And as it was midday, he still found himself widening that circle. And he said, he better start back. So he, he starts back. And as he goes back, he, he realizes he may not make it till sundown. And so he, he runs faster and faster. And then the sun is setting low and he's not anywhere near where he needs to be. He increases his pace and he's been running and walking all day. And finally, he realizes only with tremendous effort will he make it back before the sun goes below the last peak. And just as the sun dips, he comes exhausted, falling to the point of origin. And of course, you know, this is no story, except he must die. And so he died. And so the question is, how much land does a man need? About six feet by three feet, as it turns out. I think this is what Solomon is talking about. Let's continue the reading in Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Naked a man comes from his mother's womb, and as he comes, so he departs. He takes nothing from his labor that he can carry with his hand. A little hint there about where contentment might really be. It might be in something you can't see or touch or carry away with you. It might be something inside. Let's continue. Then Solomon says, I realize that it's good and proper for a man to eat and drink and to find satisfaction in his toilsome labor under the sun during the few days of life God has given him. Oh boy. For this is his lot. Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and to be happy in his work, this is a gift of God. And he seldom reflects on the days of his life because God keeps him occupied with gladness of heart. Solomon seems to be saying, that if you could just forget about everything except just working and enjoying life, that you wouldn't have time to think about anything else. And that would be kind of a blessing. He might define contentment as never thinking about whether you're content or not. Just being so busy, you know, that you don't think about it. But as he goes on with his life and on with his story, he concludes at the end of the book with a little bit brighter picture. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is, and as some versions more accurately translate, the whole of a person. Maybe that's what you carry with you when life is over. This is really an echo of the contentment that we see in the heart of Jesus. And I want you to think about how your contentment honors your Father in heaven. And how a certain level of discontentment dishonors his love and provision for you and for me. Sometimes I go to Walmart and I, I try to avoid the toy aisle. It's not pleasant. I want that. I want that. You know, sometimes you get that. And it reminds me that um, sometimes we're not pleased with our parents' provisions. And there can be falling down on the floor and there can be tantrums. Now, we don't do that as adults. We just have a le level of gripiness or murmuring or complaining that says we're discontent with the Heavenly Father's provision for us. I think that dishonors Him. Now, we're going to see that that doesn't mean we don't better ourselves or we don't use our talents and what God has given us to do and the work before us in this life. But in the doing and the getting and the going, it's very important that we honor God with our contentment. Because what that says is, I so trust you as a heavenly parent, that your love for me is so great and your power is so great and your concern and care for me is so great that I can just rest even in this moment when things are maybe not going as I would like them to go. Because you are my father. And I have this deep inner sense of a relationship with you that is all right. And there's peace there and that you're in control of all that happens to me. I think that is contentment. And the secret of Jesus' contentment was that relationship. John chapter 14, he says, if anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. If God is in your home, 
That is, in your heart. That's contentment. That sense of well-being, that inner peace, that your relationship with God is, is all right. Do you have that today? If not, it's just a step away. You can confess Christ and be baptized for the remission of your sins. And the blood of Jesus will cleanse you and you'll be placed in the family of God. He'll come in and make his home with you. And as a child of God, if you've kind of wandered out into the world and you've, you're just generally discontent and you've lost this peace of this relationship with God, it's just a prayer away. Even right now as you're sitting there, you can say, Lord, restore my relationship with you that I may have a deep inner peace that all is right between us. And I express my confidence in you that whatever happens to me, you will make it for my good. The counselor, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. And do not be afraid. Looking deep into the heart of Jesus, in the midst of struggles and turmoils, even beatings and death, disappointments, he had an inner peace. He said, my father is always with me. That's contentment. My Father is always with me. And there's perhaps no greater way to honor your Father than to be at peace in his house. To be at peace in your heart because of who he is and where he is and what he has promised. Amen? That's contentment. It is that sense of rest or peace that comes from being right with God and knowing that he is working everything to your happiness. Jesus had no place to live. He said the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man does not have a place to lay his head. And yet, I think he slept well every night. He had this deep sense of con contentment that we need so much as we follow him and seek it to follow in his path and to be more like him in this way. 1 Timothy chapter 6. It's a lengthy reading, but it's Paul's advice. But godliness with contentment is great gain. You know, Mahatma Gandhi said, I would like to see people try to compete with me in this area of contentment, which is my greatest treasure. You see, sometimes we compete for the things of this world. And he said, I would like to see people compete with me about contentment. And I think Jesus would say, you don't have to compete with me. It's available for all of us as it was for me. Join me in living a contented life. Godliness with contentment is the treasure. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing... We will be content with that. We have so much more. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith. Yeah, they're not here this morning. And if you trace the root of this, it would be their eagerness for material gain and they pierce themselves through with many griefs. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, who while testifying before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which God will bring about in his own time. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, 
whom no one has seen or can see. To him be honor and might forever. Amen. Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation in the coming age, so they may take hold of the life that is truly life. We only have so much time in this world, so much attention that we can pay every day. Someone has suggested that we should look at our attention as a limited resource that we must husband very carefully. And we focus our attention and reserve and allocate our attention to those things that will bring deep and eternal contentment, not those things that we can never take with us, but those things that are eternal and belong to God. As I was thinking about this, I wanted to ask the question, what contentment is not sometimes helps. Contentment, Denny, is not a cover for your laziness. <laughs> well, I'm just content not to do that. Feel good about that? That may be an absence of ambition to please God. We might just call that laziness. You say, well, I'm just content not to serve. I'm just content not to do that good deed. I'm just content not to assemble and encourage. I've, I'm just content. No, you're, you may just be lazy. Denny, uh, contentment is not a justification for the status quo. Things may need to change. But I just don't want to put forth that effort. And, I, and, and so I just justify the way I am and the way things are. And I just say, you know, I'm, I'm just content with that. Somebody says, you really ought to. And I said, no, no, I, I'm, I'm, I'm content with it. That's not contentment. <laughs> That's a justification of the status quo. When God asks us to do something and we say, I'm content not to do it. What do we call that? That's disobedience. And so contentment is not a cover for disobedience. God has asked us to seek and to work and to serve and to do and to become. And we say, well, I, I, you know, I, I don't want to grow. I don't care about that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm content with what I am and who I am and, and the level of my service right now. That's not contentment. That's an excuse for disobedience. We may say, well, I was feeling guilty, but I don't want to feel guilty. You know why? Because when I feel guilty, I don't feel content. And the preacher said we should feel content. So I'm just going to reject those feelings of guilt. Contentment is not a rejection or an antidote for conviction. When the Holy Spirit is convicting us that change needs to occur within us, in, in our lives, and we say, I don't like that feeling. That makes me feel, I think, maybe discontent. And I'm supposed to be content. And so I'm just going to just forget about that guilt and that conviction. And I'm not going to respond to the Holy Spirit's leading in that because I feel better if I'm just content, you see. Laziness, lack of conviction, justification of the status quo, downright disobedience can all be cloaked in this magic word. I'm just a content person. No, no, that's, that's not what it is. That's not what the Bible says. Well, you say, well, could contentment be found in money? Well, it couldn't be. Whether you're pursuing a big dream or a small one means being at peace with whatever God gives you. But if money was contentment, then you couldn't be content when you were poor. Well, no, that's not right. That's not what the Bible teaches. If contentment was victory, you couldn't be content in defeat. If contentment was the absence of pain, you couldn't be content, deep contentment in illness. If it was accomplishment, what would you do when you failed? And if it was sinlessness, what would you do with your feelings of guilt? You see, these things are not contentment. They are just what they are, what they're named. Contentment is that relationship with God that you know is all right and that he's taking care of you. Contentment cannot be found in the world. First John chapter 2 says, Love not the world, 
neither the things of the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. We've come here today, and I want to encourage you to find your contentment, the deep and lasting sense of security and peace in your relationship with God. And that there is nothing that is contradictory in your energy and zeal to change and to work and to do with this feeling of contentment. In fact, it is only from a true sense of a relationship with God that is all right and that he will take care of us that we can let go and actually serve him without fear of what may happen to us or what's going to occur in our lives. God will provide. Philippians chapter 4 Paul said, I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content whatever the circumstance. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. That passage, I can do all things, is in the context of learning the secret of being content, knowing and believing that God will provide all you need no matter what. It was Jesus who said, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. How many of you still have a VCR? Yeah, it's probably pretty dusty. We got the fast forward thing going on there. One man was in the hospital, he had leukemia, and he was really wasting away. And the preacher went to visit him and really didn't know what to say. And he said, you know, I've learned something through all of this. And he said, what's that? And he said that life is not like my VCR. I can't fast forward through this stuff. But he said, I have learned that Jesus is in every frame of every picture. That is the only way in which we can find contentment when all does not seem to be well. There is something that is deeper that is just as it should be and has a promise that it will be just as it shall be and should be.